Pain, threat, and other unpleasant stimuli usually trigger an attack behavior. In humans, we call this aggression or anger. In animals, though, we can't say how they feel. We can't really ask them, so we talk about it in terms of their behavior. Attack behaviors are often associated with increased activity in a part of the amygdala called the corticomedial area. Let's take a look at where this is. So here's kind of a glass view of the brain. Here's thalamus, caudate nuclei on either side, putamen, so here are your basal ganglia. Here would be the uh, hippocampus, and then at the anterior end of each hippocampus, you'll find the amygdala right here. If we do a coronal section through the brain, here you'll see the temporal lobe, here's the sylvian fissure, and in the medial part of the temporal lobe here is the amygdala, at least at this level. A little bit further back, more posterior, you'd be in the hippocampus. The amygdala isn't just a single structure, though. It's really composed of multiple nuclei. Right here is the corticomedial area, or corticomedial nucleus, of the amygdala. It's on the medial surface, and it's adjacent to the cortex right here. Here it is on a larger view. After we experience a provocation, we and animals are more likely to attack for a period of time afterwards. And during this time, we have increased activity in this part of the brain. This has been observed mainly in animals, but there's some evidence that this holds true in humans as well. An initial attack behavior increases the probability of a second attack. So for example, if you take a male hamster and put another male hamster into its cage, the home hamster, the one who feels as, as if the cage belongs to him, will start to sniff the away hamster, and within about 30 seconds, it will attack. If you then take away that away hamster and wait a little while and put in a new hamster, you don't have to wait the 30 seconds. The, the home hamster will immediately attack the away hamster. You can bypass that initial 30 second waiting period though, just by uh, stimulating directly the corticomedial area of the amygdala. There seems to be a genetic influence on aggressive behaviors as well. Uh, this shouldn't be too surprising. Every behavior we've looked at so far has some genetic contribution. This is evidenced by the fact that monozygotic twins are more similar to each other than dizygotic twins in their rates of violent and criminal behavior. The only difference between monozygotic and dizygotic twin pairs are that the monozygotic twin pairs share more of their genes. It's also been observed that adopted children are more similar to their biological parents than their adoptive parents, again in terms of their likelihood of violent and aggressive behaviors. On average, men engage in more aggressive and violent behaviors than do females, and young men engage in more aggressive and violent behaviors than older men. This increased aggressive behavior is almost certainly at least partly related to the hormone testosterone. Men have more testosterone and young men have more testosterone than older men. And even among men of the same age group, it's been shown that there's a relationship between testosterone levels and aggressive behavior. For example, research with people who've been convicted of crimes show that those convicted of violent behaviors have slightly higher testosterone levels on average than those that are convicted of other types of behaviors. Here are some data that show this. This is showing you testosterone levels in men convicted of different kinds of crimes. Men with the highest rates of violent behavior have slightly higher testosterone levels. You can see from this figure here that men convicted of rape and murder, about half of them had higher than average testosterone levels. Less than a quarter had lower than average testosterone levels. If you compare that to people convicted of burglary, drug offenses, or armed robbery, you can see that they have a more typical pattern. Burglars and armed robbers tend to have about equal proportions of high, low, and intermediate levels of testosterone. And you can see, interestingly, more drug offenders have lower than average levels of testosterone. It's unclear why this is, whether it's a result of drug use, just isn't clear.
Testosterone seems to alter the way people respond to stimuli. For example, in women who typically have pretty low levels of testosterone, if you give them testosterone, if you increase the level of testosterone in their bloodstream, it changes how they pay attention to stimuli. For example, it tends to increase their heart rate, and there's an increased tendency to pay attention longer and more vigorously to situations related to conflict and aggression. For example, angry faces or pictures depicting violence or conflict. If you think back to the general theories of emotion, they include both the cognition, the physical component, the change in the body's state of arousal, and the emotion itself. Here you've got a change in the body's state of arousal and a change in cognition, an increased likelihood to think about or pay attention to conflict or aggression. Together these may increase the conflict and aggression itself. There's also a connection between aggressive behavior and low serotonin release. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter used by some neurons in the brain to communicate with one another. Turnover is the amount of release and resynthesis of a neurotransmitter by presynaptic neurons. The first study to show evidence of this relationship was a study with mice in the 1970s. They found that male mice isolated for four weeks had increased aggressive behavior and decreased serotonin turnover. 5-hydroxyindoloacetic acid, or 5-HIAA for short, is a serotonin metabolite that you can find in the blood, the CSF, and the urine, and we can use this as an index of turnover rate. So a metabolite is kind of a breakdown product. When serotonin is released at the synapse, it tends to get broken down, and this is one of the breakdown products. High levels imply much higher serotonin release and turnover than low levels. Research with monkeys in a natural environment has shown that low levels of 5-HIAA, in other words, low levels of serotonin turnover, tend to increase the likelihood of a monkey attacking larger monkeys. And few monkeys with very high levels tended to survive past age 6. Conversely, monkeys with high levels of serotonin turnover were more likely to survive. They were also less likely to uh, attack larger monkeys and less likely to become injured. So this raises an interesting question. If low levels of serotonin turnover are associated with a shorter lifespan and increased likelihood of injury, how is it that genes that predispose monkeys to have these low levels, and therefore higher aggression, have survived? Why is it that this predisposition hasn't been selected out of the population by natural selection? It could be that evolution has selected for an intermediate level of anxiety and aggression. Uh, and within the population, there's going to be natural variation in the level of anxiety and aggression. Very high anxiety could lead to problems, as could very low levels of anxiety and associated higher levels of aggression. Alternatively, evolution might occasionally select for high aggressive behaviors. You could imagine that monkeys that are more aggressive may be more likely to die young, but they may also be more likely to achieve a dominant position within the troop while they are alive, and therefore gain access to the reproductive resources of the females in the troop. Sort of a high-stakes game that they're playing, where they may be more likely to die young, but they're also maybe more likely to pass their genes on once in a while. In human studies, there's a relationship between low serotonin turnover and people with a history of violent behavior and violent crime. People who attempt suicide by violent means, for example with a gun, and recurrent violent behaviors and subsequent suicide attempts. But of course, a simple blood test doesn't allow us to reliably identify violent people any more than a simple blood test for testosterone would. There's also a relationship between the level of cortisol, another hormone, and aggression. Higher cortisol levels lead to less aggressive behaviors. So there could be a, a kind of balancing act between these different hormones and neurotransmitters. This is showing you the concentration of 5-HIAA in the blood of three groups of individuals. People who've never attempted suicide, people who've attempted it once, and people who've attempted it multiple times. The role of serotonin is complicated, though, and although it might be tempting, we shouldn't think of it as somehow an 
anti-aggression neurotransmitter. In fact, during aggressive acts, there's an increase in the release of serotonin in certain parts of the brain. Okay, moving away from anger and on to fear. Fear is associated with a strong tendency to escape from an immediate threat. Anxiety, which is similar, is more of a general sense that something dangerous might occur, but without being necessarily associated with an immediate desire to flee. The startle reflex is a really common and uh, useful way to measure anxiety or fear. Unlike, say, happiness, where you have to ask people how they're feeling, with the startle reflex, this is kind of an objective measure that doesn't necessarily require people to introspect and think about how they're feeling. You can just measure this objectively. So it's an extremely fast response to an unexpected loud noise. You hear the noise and immediately your neck tenses up, your shoulders come up a bit as if you're trying to protect your neck, which sort of makes sense from an evolutionary perspective. Your neck is a very vulnerable part of your body. We see this startle reflex even in young infants. Infants who have never had anything terrible happen to them, no experiences that would have allowed them to learn that loud noises are associated with things you would need to protect yourself against. The auditory information stimulates parts of the pons that tense the neck and other muscles. Importantly, the startle reflex isn't a pure reflex. It can be influenced by current mood and it can be influenced by past experiences. And we know that cells and parts of the amygdala are responsible for this kind of fear conditioning, this kind of learning. For example, you can take rats and show them a light and then shock their feet and do that a few times. And it doesn't take long before the rats start to freeze. That's their version of the startle reflex. They start to freeze in response to the light and not just the shock. They've come to associate that light with the shock. Unless you damage the amygdala, when you damage the amygdala, they will still experience fear in response to the shock, but they'll no longer come to anticipate the shock after the light. They're unable to do fear conditioning. This is showing you the location of the amygdala here. And you can see some of the inputs from visual cortex, from thalamus. These parts of the brain can then uh, alter the state of the amygdala and allow for conditioning. And then you can see outputs from the amygdala influencing the startle reflex. Output from the amygdala to the hypothalamus controls autonomic fear responses. The hypothalamus you can think of as kind of the output system of the brain for controlling the sympathetic and parasympathetic branches of the autonomic nervous system. The amygdala also has axons that project into the prefrontal cortex that may help regulate approach and avoidance. Approach and avoidance are ways of describing behavior. Uh, approach is associated with less fear, uh, less anxiety, and avoidance is associated with more fear and more anxiety. So damage to the amygdala interferes both with learning of fear responses, for example, the rats and light association that I just measured. It also prevents retention of fear responses previously learned. So in other words, you can take a rat that's learned to associate a light with a shock and damage the amygdala, and they no longer make that association anymore. It's as if the amygdala is important for interpreting stimuli with emotional consequences. We see something similar in monkeys who've had their amygdala damaged. This is known as Kluver-Busey syndrome. This was illustrated first in the early 1900s by damaging the amygdala in monkeys. These monkeys tended to be more calm and placid, less anxious, just very chill monkeys. They displayed less than normal fear of snakes. Monkeys normally hate snakes and stay away from them. Uh, and also less than normal fear of larger, more dominant monkeys. And they seem to have a hard time interpreting threat gestures by these larger, more dominant monkeys. Again, displaying difficulty in understanding the, the emotional consequences or the uh, what should be fearful consequences of stimuli in the environment. It also seems to increase the approach motive. So again, if they're less anxious, less worried about what might happen, they're more likely to go and explore the world around them.
In humans, amygdala damage seems to impair the ability to recognize emotions in photographs or pictures, particularly for fear and disgust. It doesn't, however, seem to affect the ability to recognize fear in real life. Uh, people who've had damage to the amygdala have spent their whole lives up until they acquired that damage learning the rules of the world around them and associations in the world around them. And so they tend to understand what things should generate fear, but they don't actually generate fear in these individuals. So they know that it should be scary, but for example, they don't show an increased galvanic skin response or skin conductance response, suggesting that they actually feel more anxious themselves. Part of their inability to recognize emotions and faces, particularly fear, may have to do with patterns of attention. So it's becoming clear that the amygdala is important for directing attention to relevant stimuli in the environment. Uh, in one patient who had damage to her amygdala, she was unable to recognize fearful faces in photographs, but the experimenters noticed that she was paying attention more to the mouth rather than the eyes, where you would extract that kind of information about fear. When they asked her to uh, explicitly look at the eyes, she was then able to recognize the fearful expressions. This is a study with healthy subjects that illustrates something similar. So here they cropped out the entire face of photographs of people making different kinds of emotional expressions except for the eye whites. They left the eye whites. You can see right away that this person is either very scared or very excited. So this would be a fearful expression, and you can recognize that just by the eyes. This person, it's very difficult to tell what their expression is without seeing the mouth and the rest of the face. Interestingly, just looking at the fearful eye whites increases activity in the amygdala compared to uh, eye whites of a happy face. Again, suggesting the amygdala is important for in interpreting stimuli with emotional consequences. There's now pretty solid evidence that genetic variations, sort of innate predispositions to have high or low levels of amygdala activity, is associated with anxiety and the experience of other negative emotions. These variations may underlie variations in anxiety in the population and also seem to be related to anxiety disorders. It's been shown that individuals who experience negative emotions more frequently tend to have increased arousal of the amygdala, increased activity in that part of the brain. And people with excessive fear and anxiety disorders tend to have hyperactive amygdalas as well. Let's talk about the relationship between stress and health. Behavioral medicine is a relatively new field of inquiry that emphasizes the effects of diet, smoking, exercise, stress, and other behaviors on health. Emotions and other experiences we're coming to learn can influence illness and the pattern of recovery from illness in pretty dramatic ways. But first, what is stress? Like emotion, it's a little bit hard to define. Hans Selye was a pioneer in studying stress. He noticed as a physician that lots of different kinds of disease led to a similar kind of response in the body, lethargy, fever, and so forth. He also noticed that in his research with rats, that just about anything you did to the rat that would cause pain or, or stress to the rat resulted in a similar pattern of responses within the rat's body. In addition to the specific responses made by disease, he argued that threats on the body activate a general response he called the general adaptation syndrome. Robert Sapolsky has argued that the nature of today's crises are more prolonged, which has resulted in the widespread stress-related illnesses and psychiatric problems that we now observe in industrialized societies. He argues that long-term inescapable issues, things like uh, not making enough money to pay your bills, having a boss that's really difficult to work with, and so forth, can also activate this general adaptation syndrome, can create a long-term response to stress, which is, over time, bad for our health, both physically and mentally. Our minds and our bodies have evolved to respond to brief stressors, brief things that are scary, and then, once those issues have resolved, we can go back to a, a regular routine. 
Stress tends to activate two systems in the body. The first we've already talked about. It's the autonomic nervous system, specifically increasing the activity of the sympathetic nervous system, that fight or flight response that prepares the body for brief emergency responses. And then it can be deactivated relatively quickly. The HPA axis mediates a more long-term response. HPA is short for hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenal cortex. This becomes the dominant response to prolonged stressors. The hypothalamus induces the pituitary gland to release a hormone called adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH. Hopefully this is sounding familiar. We talked about the same system in the last chapter in the context of girls with CAH, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. The ACTH released by the pituitary in turn stimulates the adrenal cortex to secrete the hormone cortisol, usually described as a stress hormone. Cortisol enhances metabolic activity and elevates levels of blood sugar and other nutrients to get the body ready for action. This is showing you the HPA axis. Here's the hypothalamus that produces a local hormone called a releasing factor, which directs the anterior pituitary to release ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone, into the blood. The ACTH then instructs the adrenal cortex to produce cortisol, as well as small levels of testosterone and other hormones, as we saw in the last chapter. But here we'll be focusing mainly on cortisol. Prolonged increases in cortisol levels tend to impair the immune system. This happens mainly by impairing protein synthesis, which is crucial for how the immune system functions. This leads us to psychoneuroimmunology, which is the relatively new field that studies the relationship between the nervous system and the immune system. I'm sure you already know that your mental state can influence your immune system, but of course your immune system and what goes on in the body can also influence your brain and your mental state. There are complicated relationships at work here, and this field is aimed at understanding them. So it deals with the way in which experiences, particularly stress, can alter the immune system. And in turn, it also deals with how the activity of the immune system can feed back and influence the central nervous system. In response to stressful experiences, the nervous system can actually activate the immune system directly. It signals the immune system to increase the production of natural killer cells, a kind of white blood cell, and also increase the production of cytokines, a signaling molecule used by the body during infections. These cytokines then trigger the release of another kind of chemical called prostaglandins. Prostaglandins can actually cross the blood-brain barrier and directly stimulate the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus, in turn, changes its activity, which can lead to symptoms of illness itself. Things like increased body temperature, lethargy, decreased sex drive, and so forth. Those symptoms are helpful in fighting disease, but in this case, they can actually be triggered in response to stress. Prolonged stress, as you probably know, can damage the body. Prolonged increases in cortisol impair synthesis of proteins in the immune system. Prolonged stresses of longer than a month can significantly increase the likelihood of illness. 